I'm staff reporter Philip Matthews and Munted is my perspective on the Christchurch earthquakes. Over seven episodes, we'll show how and why a New Zealand city was munted, first by Mother Nature and then by politics. This time on Munted, after even John Key grew bored of himself, and a red tide swept south, the future took shape in Christchurch. In this episode, where are we? Who are we? What are we even doing here? And is it any good? Thank you guys. By 2016, Prime Minister John Key was starting to look like a man who had lost interest. So that must have been making a hell of a noise in the newspaper. He's got a mark on his head from it? Yeah, you poor thing, yeah. Where were you? I was standing up there playing gear, computer games. Okay. Yeah, and uh, everything seemed to cave in. Yeah, yeah. Here he is at the scene of yet another earthquake in Kaikoura, north of Christchurch. His resignation at the end of that year only came as a surprise to those who hadn't been observing his body language. A few months later, he was gone. Other important figures from the early days of the Christchurch rebuild had moved on too. Roger Sutton quit Sarah at the end of 2014 amidst sexual harassment complaints. I've hurt somebody with that behaviour and I'm very, very sorry about that. Me leaving now, it just just feels like the right thing to do. I'm just, I'm just really tired. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Warwick Isaacs left the Central City Development Unit just three months later and Education Minister Hekia Parata announced her retirement from politics in 2016. And after Bob Parker had opted not to contest the Christchurch mayoralty in 2013, Leandel Zell took over. Sarah was itself wound down as government power started to devolve to other agencies and even to the Christchurch City Council of all people. It's the city really gradually taking back that foundation of control and um, leading recovery. Well, I'm hoping that things will have changed before we get to April 1. (laughs) This didn't happen to be my minister. (laughs) He's got swag. (laughs) Sarah's legacy was mixed. An Auditor General report in 2017 said that Sarah's approach had caused delays in the rebuild and led to poor communication and tension with council. Brownlee, of course, strongly disagreed. Meanwhile, the tidal wave of Jacinda mania that hit New Zealand in 2017 made Christchurch a Labour town again. The city's political leadership went from looking like this to looking like this. With the famously no-nonsense Megan Woods picking up the role of Minister for All Christchurch Matters. It's not the first time men have made a mess and women have had to tidy it up afterwards. Labour promised a $300 million payout for the rebuild, which was almost inevitably earmarked for the new stadium because rugby must always be the first priority. They also promised a Royal Commission into EQC and an arbitration body for those still stuck in insurance hell. All of that was popular with the Labour faithful, but the most popular thing was the general vibe of it. You and your city know exactly what your priorities are, and that is why you will decide how that $300 million is spent. Christchurch should decide how novel that sounded. Three years later, what does this brave new world look like? Several of the rebuild's biggest and most difficult anchor projects are still years away from completion. The stadium is at best another four years away, by which time even Queen will have finished touring. The Metro Sports Facility should be ready in about two years. The Performing Arts Precinct might have a car park on it by next year, and a theatre at some point. And as for the Convention Centre that swallowed Gloucester Street, that will finally open next year, but COVID-19 may have made it redundant. The South Frame, that was supposed to be a park-like area, is still a series of car dealers with the occasional laneway added. There have been obvious successes too. The Margaret Mahi Playground, the bus station, the Turanga Library, Although it's hard for a council to go wrong building libraries, playgrounds and bus stations. And remember Jim Anderton, who was defeated by Bob Parker in the mayoral race after the 2010 earthquake? 
He retired from Parliament in 2011, but Anderton was not one to sit around in retirement. He teamed up with former National MP Philip Burden to campaign and fundraise for the restoration of Christchurch's Anglican Cathedral, when even the church itself was unwilling to. In five years, 10 years or 30 years, people are going to say, what was done at the time to save this? And if you pull it down in an instant of trauma, you'll have many, many years to think about why you made that decision, because you can't undo it once you've done it. The fight went on for years until Anderton and Burden, who had been on opposite sides of politics in the 1980s and 90s, were successful and the cathedral will be repaired. Work is expected to take another 10 years. Anderton died in 2018, but he lived long enough to see the Anglican Church agree to restore it. In February 2020, a day after the ninth anniversary of the 2011 earthquake, Mayor Leanne Dalzell offered a formal apology from the city to relatives of those killed. It was opposed by some family members who would rather have seen those responsible for the CTV collapse behind bars. I am also aware that not all of the families will welcome an apology. Nothing I can say or do will change what happened on that day. Nothing will restore to them what has been lost. The character of the central city has changed. Not just the look, but the ambience, the feeling. That was unavoidable. Some find the new Christchurch to be soulless, like an open-air mall that was too obviously designed to serve tourism and commerce. It needs time to become itself, to find its own personality again and to become a city in reality and not just a city on paper. There was an obsession with events and visitor numbers, with using metrics to calculate a city's success and the promotion of a narrow idea of the city. Parts of it don't work yet. Cathedral Square still looks shabby and will for another decade. Sarah had originally wanted the square to be done by 2016. New Brighton is hoping that suburban renewal will come now that some hot water pools have opened which is a gamble. What happens in the vast former red zone is critical. And a generation of kids have grown up during earthquakes in their aftermath, and they remain affected by the shock and trauma. It has been found that large numbers of Christchurch children exhibit symptoms of post-traumatic stress. But there is also a new openness to the world after the earthquakes. Christchurch feels less insular. There was more diversity. A sense of hope started to emerge after 10 years, although COVID-19's impact on tourism is another setback for the city. There was also a sense that the city was a laboratory for political ideas. And as was said about the mass closure of schools and the operation of rebuild agencies, things were done to an already struggling population. Too quickly, too dramatically, and often without consultation or consent. That's the dream from me. Why on earth would we be great? The political slogan, nothing about us without us, was often seen at protests in the years after the earthquakes. Nothing about us. This meant that people in Christchurch thought the rebuild was being done to them, not with them. And that their own city had been taken away from them. There are universal lessons, too often obscured behind corny pep talk about resilience and stoicism. About how power operates. How democracy should work and how the public should be served that can be taken away from the experience of Christchurch. It is about a population that was forever changed in a city that was munted.